Coming up on the FSR Sark Fighter podcast, Dr. Kamal Baruka is a medical researcher in the rare disease space, but one day he found himself dealing with a rare disease, sarcoidosis. Uh, one day I went to my um, primary care physician's office uh, for a routine health checkup. And uh, in a very, he had a very puzzled look as he had trouble feeling or hearing my heartbeat. Sarcoidosis had attacked his heart. To my surprise, my heart rate was in the 30s, uh, despite my being relatively asymptomatic. Kamal's story is coming up. This is the Sark Fighter Podcast, living with sarcoidosis and other rare diseases. Here's your host, John Carlin. Hi everyone, I'm John Carlin. This episode is brought to you by Atire Pharmaceuticals. To learn more about their new pulmonary sarcoidosis trial, FSOFIT, visit stopsarcoidosis.org slash Atire trial. And I'm going to have a big update on that trial here in just a moment. In the meantime, let me tell you that I hope you are feeling uh, as well as you can if you're here in the sarcoidosis space. Sorry you have to be here, but welcome to the club. Uh, I do this podcast to sort of help you understand what's going on with you, to give you a sense of hope as you deal with this unpredictable disease, and to the extent that it's possible, because it's a snowflake disease that affects everyone differently, maybe to normalize it a little bit so you won't feel like you're the only one who is dealing with all of these different things that, that comes with the uh, things that come with sarco- sarcoidosis. But um, before we get to Kamau in today's interview, I want to let you know that uh, I hope to have solved the problem here on the podcast of some of the disappearing early episodes. So what was happening was every time I posted a new episode, one of the early episodes disappeared. So I contacted the uh, Podbean, who, was, uh, who I do this podcast through, and they explained that I needed to change some settings, which I did. And they said within a couple of days, all those episodes should reappear and they should stay there for years and years. So hopefully that is fixed. So if anybody goes back and tries to listen on whatever um, app you use for your podcast. Most people use Apple, but uh, whatever app you use and you go back to listen to episode 11, episode 12, episode 13, somewhere around there, all the way back to episode one, um, and they've disappeared, uh, if you would let me know if they are back, I would really appreciate that. Best thing to do is just email me at carlinagency at gmail.com. But I promised you I would look into that. I don't really, I'm not real great at the back end part of these podcasts, um, but I did figure out uh, what to do and hopefully that fixed it. Now, as I promised, there's great news from Atire Pharma. They have completed enrollment for their study of Efsofitamide. They call that study Efsofit, uh, which is a drug that is showing great promise in fighting sarcoidosis and becoming an option that could replace the need for all of us to take prednisone. That's what it's been looking like so far. They call that a steroid sparing, um, what do they call it? A therapy, I guess is the best way to uh, to call it. So now this actually came out on July 22nd, 2024. So just about a month ago, and I neglected to put it in the previous podcast. So, um, but I do, I do want to let you guys know that this is what's going on. And so I'm going, I'm going to read you just, just bits and pieces from this news release here. Atar Pharma Incorporated, uh, a clinical stage biotechnology company engaged in the discovery and development of a first-in-class net class medicine from its proprietary uh, yada, 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 today announced that it has completed, I didn't want to go into all the technical terms, today announced that it has completed enrollment in its global Pivotal Phase 3 EFSOFIT study of its lead therapeutic candidate, EFSOFITAMOD, in patients with pulmonary sarcoidosis, a major form of interstitial lung disease with limited treatment options. The study enrolled 268 patients at 85 centers in nine countries, exceeding the target enrollment. 
top line data from the study expected in the third quarter of 2025. And then just a couple of quotes here, but these are important. These are people whose names you probably need to know if you live here in the sarcoidosis space. So uh, the first one reads as follows. Completing enrollment in this landmark study is an important milestone that brings us one step closer to delivering a potentially groundbreaking treatment to address the significant unmet need for pulmonary sarcoidosis patients, said Sanjay S. Shukla, MD, MS, President and Chief Executive Officer of ATIRE. He continues, we are grateful to all of the patients and their caregivers, our principal investigators and their teams, our many advocacy partners, and our partner, uh, Kyrin Pharmaceutical Company Limited, who made this, uh, who helped make this accomplishment possible. The historic number of patients enrolled in this study signifies the strong patient demand for a new treatment option such as Efsofitamod. Uh, and as you know, Sanjay uh, has been on this podcast several times, and they are studying. Uh, Efsofitamod, of course, for pulmonary sarcoidosis because that's where most of the need is. But uh, he has said that, uh, and, and other doctors I've talked to have said, look, if it, you know, if it, if it stops sarcoidosis in one part of your body, it's likely that it'll stop it in another part of your body. Now, that hasn't been proven, uh, but that is, um, it's not a big leap of faith to say that at this point. It hasn't been studied. I don't want to put words in their mouth. But, but anyway, so uh, today uh, my guest uh, Kamal uh, has cardiac sarcoidosis. I have neurosarcoidosis. Um, and I just, I just hope that this could be something that could be uh, available down the line. And then there's another quote from another doctor whose name you maybe have heard, uh, but it says, this is a monumental achievement for the sarcoidosis community. It's by far the largest interventional study ever to be conducted in sarcoidosis. We expect the results of this trial to yield valuable insights that will inform sarcoidosis research and treatment in the years to come. That's from Dr. Daniel Carver, DO, Chair of the Division of Pulmonary Medicine at Cleveland Clinic and also the lead primary investigator of the study. He concludes, we are optimistic based on positive phase 1B and 2A results that Efsofitamon could be a potentially transformative therapy for sarcoidosis patients, which is greatly needed. We look forward to the readout from this study in 2025. All right, folks. So I tell you that I do this podcast to give you hope. And uh, let me just say that uh, that is a solid solid dose of hope right there. So there is progress. And you know, none of this none of this happens without the sarcoidosis community coming together as a community. This podcast is is just a small small part of it, but but uh, being able to work with the folks at the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research and being able to amplify the voices of the the researchers involved um it just feels like things are kind of headed in the right direction. So that is great news from Atire. And uh, Sanjay has said that he'll come back on the podcast, Dr. Shukla, uh, and he will talk a little bit more about the, the results and the findings when he feels the timing is right and then it's appropriate. And, of course, he has a, a standing invitation to join me here on the FSR uh, Sark Fighter podcast. Now, a uh, couple of personal notes. First of all, I am going to be traveling to Alaska this month. Uh, in This is August of 2024. Another bucket list thing for me, one of the places that I wanted to see and experience. This will be a cycling, kayaking, and hiking adventure. And with any luck, I think we're, we're going to take a boat out in the sound uh, no one has called that a whale watching tour, but there's an opportunity to see a whale as well, and that would be that would be really cool. But you've heard me talk about this before, and I've had other people on the podcast or in private express to me that when when they were diagnosed, it sort of accelerated their timeline. Right? It's like, wow, you know, I was walking around healthy yesterday, now I'm in the hospital, or now I've got this disease that hit me out of left field. I've always been the active one in the family, and Seems like that's a repetitive theme. Um, and then after you get sarcoidosis and you get it under control, it kind of says, well, you know what? I'm not going to wait 
to go do all this stuff that I always said that I was going to do. So for me, the first thing I, I know, I had never seen the Grand Canyon. Um, and, you know, for people who travel all over the world, maybe the Grand Canyon sounds like, you know, not not that big a deal. Uh, I can tell you after looking at it, it is that big a deal. But if you haven't been there, um, it's, you know, it was just something like, you know, I want to go see this big hole in the ground. And, and uh, you know, now I want to go back. But but it was one of the first things that I did. And Alaska is sort of the same thing with me. So uh, I wanted to go to Alaska. I want to see the glaciers and, and do all the things. And so we are working with uh, a travel group called Backroads. This will be my, I think, my fourth event with Backroads. Um, and they just do a wonderful job, and they provide the bicycles and, and just the best guides in the world and stay in nice hotels. And so uh, this will not be my Erie, the Erie Canal tour where we slept in tents every night. This, this will be a little bit of an upgrade, but I'll be anxious to share the details of my trip to Alaska with you. And then before we get to the interview, I, I'm just wondering if you have had the same issues with getting your prescriptions refilled that I have had, right? So when you have a chronic condition like sarcoidosis, you likely are on some sort of medication that has to be refilled every month, right? So, and one of the ones that I take is a drug called gabapentin, and it helps immeasurably with that sort of pins and needles effect wherever you have neuropathy in your body. So I have essentially neuropathy from my chest to my feet, and it gets worse. So like my feet, it's worse in my feet than it is, say, in my chest. But Anyway, um, and that that's comes from the damage that sarcoidosis did to my spinal cord. Probably never going to be fixed, so I'm always going to be taking gabapentin. But every month, I have to go and ask for a refill. Every month, my doctor, and this is not my, this is just a local doctor who is the person that I go to when I'm feeling really bad, but but uh, this doctor is a, a rheumatologist, but this doctor is slow to respond. So you're supposed to go on my chart, put in the request. If I put it in on Wednesday, maybe it happens. Maybe it happens on Wednesday, but not always. And, you know, it, it just seems like I'm always chasing this thing. Like I'm, It's just always either just in time or I go a couple of days without it, which is terrible. And then my pharmacy is not great about letting me know uh, when they've got everything right. And, and it's, I'm really complaining. <laughs> I'm sorry. You got to listen to me for just a second, but I'm complaining because this happened to me this week. So um, I was running out of medicine. I pinged the doctor. Yes, it was on a Friday afternoon. So went all the way through the weekend, no response. So I actually called on Monday morning. I was like, ah, yeah, I got to have this. Okay, I'll get the doctor. The nurse says, I'll get the doctor right on it. Nothing. So I call the next day. Oh, 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 I'll get the doctor right on it. Nothing. Then um, I call the pharmacy because I want to see if maybe the doctor has called and I can't get to a person. So they say, you know, press one. Please say what you want. So refill a prescription. Oh, you want us to check on a prescription. Which prescription would you like? And then they give me three prescriptions, which I've had historically, and I only take one. Um, and so I say, would you like to hear the information on this? Hit two for no. Hit two. Would you like to hear information on this? Hit two for no. Hit two. And how about this one? Gabapentin. Hit one for yes. Yes, that one. Would you like to have it refilled? Hit one for yes. Yes. Okay, we will refill your, and then they go back to one of the other prescriptions, not the gabapentin. And now I can't, now I'm like, I'm in my car and I'm trying to like hit my phone and I'm not trying to be a bad driver, but I'm like, no, 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 that's the wrong thing. So I call the pharmacy and I say, pharmacy, I was going through your automated system. I tried to order my gabapentin, but you said you were going to refill a prescription I no longer need that like from when I had poison ivy a year ago or something. It was a cream. I can't even remember what it was for. Um, so they say, oh, okay, we'll take it off. Next morning, I get an email from the pharmacy. Your prescription is ready. I'm like, ah, my gabapentin. Great. I click on the link on my phone and sure enough, 
they have refilled the prescription for the cream for the poison ivy. <laughs> I'm like, no, no. So then I have to call the pharmacy and say, I didn't need that. I need the gabapentin. Well, we haven't heard from your doctor. So then I call the doctor's office again. And I'm on hold for the second time for like half an hour. I mean, it's a legitimate half an hour. You're listening to the Muzak, whatever. And I say, where is this prescription from the doctor? And they say, oh, she filled it yesterday. And I said, well, the pharmacy doesn't have it. Hmm, let me check. Well, guess what? They printed it instead of emailing it to the pharmacy. So it's sitting on somebody's desk somewhere at the hospital. <laughs> and the pharmacy doesn't have it. So finally, they call me back. It's the rheumatology lead at the local hospital. And she apologizes profusely. And I say, well, can we? Can you go into the computer and fix this? Because it's like the third time it's happened uh, that this got printed instead of being sent to the pharmacy. And every time I'm sitting around here with my nerves on fire because I don't have any gabapentin. And she apologized. And I did get my gabapentin. But I, do you have to go through that? Am I the only one? Because I am really trying. Look, they say you've got to be your own advocate, right? You can't just let the system do what it's going to do and expect that it is going to look out for you because it's not. These hospitals are too big. They've got too many patients. There's too much going on. The same thing with the pharmacies. I was very proactive. I was making phone calls. I was trying to get I was trying to get in front of this and I still couldn't. And I I hope that well, I hope it doesn't happen to you. On the other hand, I don't want to think that I'm the only one because it is so frustrating. I mean, I, I called my wife and said, Mary, you got to talk me off the ledge because I'm about ready to jump off. I'm ready to go find a bridge and jump off of it. I, I am so mad at all of these people. Um, so thank you for listening and let me know, uh, Carlin agency at gmail.com. Let me know if that's ever happened to you. I'll even bring you on the podcast if you want to. That's how mad, um, it, it makes me. Um, in the meantime, speaking of that, I, <laughs> despite my rant, I hope you're enjoying the podcast. Help me reach more people by signing up to follow the podcast. Click on the follow link where, uh, on your, whatever app you're using and, and tell other people about it, especially in, in the sarcoidosis space. You don't listen to this podcast unless you're somehow connected to sarcoidosis. But if you'll let people know that this is out there uh, and more people will listen, that that's just fantastic. It makes everything just that much more effective. All right. Coming up, Kamal joins me to talk about how uh, he went from walking around happy and free of symptoms to all of a sudden in a hospital bed with a pacemaker and a defibrillator. I feel like a zombie just feeding at stumbling. Hi, I hope you're enjoying the Sark Fighter podcast. You may be wondering, what can I do to help? How can I be a part of the sarcoidosis solution? It's simple. Make a donation to KISS. Kick in to stop sarcoidosis. 100% of the money goes to the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research. Look for a link in the show notes of the Sark Fighter podcast. Welcome back to the FSR Sark Fighter podcast. Joining me now is Kamal Barucha. Uh, Kamal, thank you so much for joining me today. You have, uh, you're a SARC patient, but you're also a physician. Yes, I am. Uh, thank you for having me on the show. Yeah. So, um, uh, I'm not sure which angle is the most interesting from the perspective of the listeners, but let's, let's start out with you as the patient. Uh, one day you woke up and things weren't quite right. What was, what was going on with you? Well, you're right. It's a long story. As um, with many patients with sarcoidosis, they look back at their lives and, and pick up clues along the way. Uh, but suddenly, in terms of a hallmark uh, uh, series of events, um, and uh, we can go into the past clues that may have uh, been underlying uh, some pathology earlier. But uh, you're right. Uh, one day, I went to my um, primary care physician's office uh, for a routine health checkup. And uh, in a 
very he had a very puzzled look as he had trouble feeling or hearing my heartbeat. Hmm. Um, and uh, up to that time, I had uh, um, just uh, uh, as we uh, it, been living pretty normally, working, productive, active. And um, to my surprise, my heart rate was in the 30s, uh, despite my being relatively asymptomatic or as far as I can tell, completely asymptomatic um, in that uh, preceding time period. And uh, one thing led to another and obviously um, was ultimately in the hands of a uh, cardiology uh, consult. But um, he did do an EKG in the office and he had been my primary care provider and I uh, had prior records of normal EKGs as recently as about a year ago. But when he did the EKG, there were obviously abnormalities there. And um, ultimately, I um, went in a urgent way to an emergency room uh, where I walked in. And as you sometimes when you go into the emergency room, you think, you know, the long wait in the chairs and the waiting area. But as I was triaged and they also confirmed my low heart rate, uh, I've never been so quickly escorted <laughs> as a patient uh, back to the, the the room to get more detailed testing. And before I knew it, um, uh, having lived a relatively normal life off any medications, I was suddenly in the ER in their prime triage area getting an emergency EKG. And then after the results revealed complete heart block, which means that your heart... Um, is based your heartbeat is based on electrical signals from the two upper chambers to your lower chamber. And when they stop communicating completely, it's called complete heart block. And um, there, and your heart rate becomes low because that's the intrinsic beat. It's not stimulated, but it's somewhere in the 30s. And the EKG they took uh, showed complete heart block. And um, I was shuttled into one of their um, uh, their, their rooms in the emergency room. And mind you, I'm completely coherent, completely asymptomatic. And taking this all in, I was not in any duress, uh, a pain. Um, so I was completely alert and oriented to what was going on. And um, they put um, th uh, this big shock uh, to just in case something bad happened to put uh, these shock pads on me. And it was very clear I was being admitted to the hospital. And um, in, in that short whirlwind stay, and I, I, I in the first, um, it, it, looking back, it's amazing how short my hospitalization is. Um, I was discharged on thank, Thanksgiving day, and I think haven't been admitted, admitted that previous Tuesday night. So it was quite a whirlwind, um, 24, 48 hours it, it, during the pandemic, no visitors allowed. Uh, and so I, 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 I wrote about that experience of being not only isolated, but frankly, quite emotionally unsettled, um, knowing full well what was going around, around me. I mean, I actually was looking up the guidelines for complete heart block as I was being treated for it as a physician um, and um, making sure everything was being done properly. But um, it was a lonely night of uh, being um, isolated in a, uh, during the pandemic. Uh, fully aware of what's going on, reading your heartbeat on the readout being so extremely low. And before any interventions were in invoked, any medication started, um, they obviously wanted to do some diagnostic testing, which included um, a cardiac MRI. Um, and um, I eventually got a PET scan a couple of weeks, a week or two out. But um, based on the results of the cardiac MRI, uh, it was clear that I had flagrant flaring uh, cardiac sarcoidosis. Um, well, they could, they never... could tell it was sarcoidosis just from those scans. They didn't think it could have been multiple other things. Yes. And I didn't get into my past history. There were clues along the way, which made it more consistent. But my understanding was that just, um, and um, I was at a, an academic medical center where they had experts on MRIs and reading cardiac MRIs with regard to even rare diseases. And it, it seemed um, completely consistent with cardiac sarcoidosis in terms of the patterns uh, that they saw. It was a very extensive um, a cardiac MRI. I think I was in that small tunnel for a couple of hours. So I wrote about how scary that was uh, and uh, hold, having to hold completely still uh, but yes, they were able to, with high certainty, in medicine, nothing's ever 100% certain. Right. 
Uh, but with given my clinical presentation, um, as I educated about myself, heart block is the most common presentation for patients with cardiac sarcoidosis, those that ultimately developed heart symptoms. So all that taken together, my medical course, uh, the findings on the cardiac MRI, and um, uh, and uh, what is known about sarcoidosis in the first place, put it all together, led to a highly, um, uh, and, and also additionally being at a cardi cardiac sarcoidosis excellent center by great fortunate circumstance, having uh, just from being close to uh, an experience center led to that diagnosis a bit more rapidly. Which and, hospital uh, were you at? I was at Stanford. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So that um, was a little bit of a trek. And, but since I was in, in any urgent distress, um, it was worth the extra drive just to go to that ER without having the... Um, the possibility of being transferred once uh, a local hospital may have realized the complicated nature of the disease. So, so we've got your, we've got your diagnosis. Uh, what we don't know is, is what they did about it. And obviously, you know, you're up, you're around, you're, you're doing well, but um, you, so you're in the hospital, you're out of the hospital, you go through the tests, they, they discover uh, and figure out that it's sarcoidosis so do they give you prednisone and say, call me back in six weeks or what, what happens next? Oh, hardly. So during that right. same hospitalization, um, they um, um, put a pacemaker with a defibrillator, uh, regardless of what's causing the heart disease. Um, my cardiac condition required uh, some support because I, my heartbeat couldn't beat on its own didn't respond to exercise, was a high risk for um, something bad happening. So in, in, in that whirlwind of a hospitalization, they urgently put in a pacemaker. And with that in, I was discharged to follow up um, uh, to a sarcoidosis clinic where I was uh, initially evaluated. And at that time was when I was started on prednisone mm -hmm. uh, as well as methotrexate. Um, mm -hmm. And um, uh, and then um, after that, I think, or before that was started, uh, so uh, the test wouldn't be, if I recall light correctly, I was uh, given a PET scan as an outpatient to get a whole body readout of the inflammation happening in my body. And sure enough, the heart was the clear focus of the disease at the time. There were some other areas that lit up, but uh, I think um, because of its existential nature, the heart was the first one uh, to treat, and therefore I was, um, as you as you uh, reasoned, uh, I was started on medication to help suppress that active disease, as well as um, um, uh, control the disease in the in the long run. Yeah, right. So now that was back during the pandemic, and we are speaking today uh, in August of 2024. So. You're what three years or thereabouts yeah. since that yeah. happened? Yeah. So Thanksgiving 2020 to um, approaching four years. Four years. Uh, yeah. All right. And how are you feeling right now? Well, um, it's interesting. I feel great. Um, I do feel um, the medications. Uh, I've always been a very active, uh, uh, you know, uh, the the quietly active. Uh, person that tires everybody out, but never overtly seems over hyper, but I just keep going. I, I, the way I describe it is like a slice of the pie is missing, but I'm still okay. I'm do, doing better, better than I'm happy where I am. But I do feel like I've lost a little slither of, uh, uh, of my energy, but in the big scheme of things, I'm still pretty functioning in the way that I want to. And um, I'm pretty happy with where I, where I am um, in terms of my productivity and happiness overall. Yeah. I'm checking my heart rate as we speak. What is it? So your heart rate was down in the thirties. What is it when you're quote unquote normal? Uh, when I'm normal? Well, um, I was diagnosed with, um, I'll, I'll talk about the new normal. Um, uh, my new normal is in the sixties on medication. So soon after, um, my getting uh, the course of prednisone and the um, 
the uh, methotrexate, which I'm still maintained on, it was diagnosed that I was in heart failure. Um, mm -hmm. So I was put on adjunctive medicine, commonly known as Entresto, Jardians, and uh, a beta blocker to help support my heart and a, a low-ish ejection fraction. So um, with, with the overlay of those medications, um, my heart rate um, was in the, uh, is, is now in the 60s, which is, um, uh, which is um, I think, target. They're very happy with that. But more importantly to me, and which I did not expect at all, was that my heart circuitry, so to speak, my conduction system completely recovered. So going from being completely dependent on a machine, a pacemaker to pace my heart, I am completely pacemaker independent. The whatever was car scarring or it, whatever inflammation was causing that, um, uh, you know, the, this connection uh, in my heartbeat uh, system has recovered. Uh, so not only physically, but psychologically, it's been an unexpected benefit and of uh, prompt treatment, um, uh, early diagnosis of the heart condition. And um, I'm 100% compliant with all my medications. I'm like the model model patient. I don't, I don't putz around. I take everything when it's for I'm almost, you know, in a very disciplined way. All that taken together has put me in a position uh, of complete recovery. And um, one of my motivations for coming on the podcast, uh, given um, how happy I'm in, don't get me wrong, I'm at I, I am a heart patient. I'm on heart failure medications. I'm doing great. My disease in remission, but I started now I put my physician researcher hat on and um, I really started thinking about whether the sudden onset, the sudden realization that I heart, had heart disease could be prevented for other patients like myself mm -hmm. living with sarcoidosis who may not have cardiac symptoms yet. Um, and to make a long story short, um, um, I think when you're, one of the, the good things to come out of um, being faced with your own mortality, um, and watching your own heartbeat in the 30s, wondering if it's going to keep beating through the night, uh, is um, you, um, um, it, as you have expressed in prior podcasts, you have a certain different sense of time and a different sense of uh, uh, um, a mindset of getting things done. So I, um, I uh, always loved writing. It was very good at it, but my career took more of a scientific turn. Uh, so I took some writing courses and that kind of unleashed um, uh, uh, some creativity and uh, ultimately combined in terms of uh, my presenting my own case at the American Thoracic Society, the biggest audience for physicians who treat sarcoidosis. And as I was researching that poster, and one of the main motivations for me to come on this podcast is to um, propose the idea that given that these are the facts that a lot of cardiac disease and sarcoidosis is undiagnosed, up to 50% uh, some papers show that people living with sarcoidosis have asymptomatic cardiac disease. Hmm. Another paper showed that sarcoidosis patients in a large epidemiological study where they look at tons of uh, people getting health care, that patients with sarcoidosis have over a 200-fold risk higher than an unaffected individual for having heart block, the, the block that causes a disturbance in heart rate. And then um, as I read more, there were sprinkles of case reports in addition to mine of patients who by themselves wearing a heart rate tracker it could be, you know, doesn't have to be brand name. It could just be, uh, um, you know, most name brand even go for 50, 60 bucks these days um, that they were on their own able to notice their heart rate declining over a period of weeks. And of all the case reports that I saw in the literature, they all turned out with great recoveries. Hmm. One person noticed that and who didn't have sarcoidosis was ultimately diagnosed with cardiac sarcoidosis, self-reported to her cardiologist saying, hey, my heart rate's trickling down. Another avid athlete noticed that their heart rate wasn't bumping while they were exercising. You know how you can measure your heart rate on the treadmill yeah. or what have you. Yeah. They noticed they didn't notice that excursion they were used to, and they self-reported to a doctor and were diagnosed both those cases, the outcomes were fantastic. And I think that's a reflection. And it's known that earlier diagnosis leads to better outcomes. 
Was it um, sarcoidosis in both of those cases? Yes, it was. It, it was sarcoidosis. So that got me thinking that perhaps um, and the theme of the poster that I presented, which um, was very well received, is that uh, there should be a education of uh, people living with uh, sarcoidosis to perhaps um, you know slap a heart rate tracker on their uh, wrist. I'm name brand agnostic. People know there are a lot of them out there. Um, it's it, it my um, we have doctor visits obviously, but they're often few months apart. And I I, I the current consensus guidelines um, say that you may recommend to get a baseline EKG, which I had, but they're only abnormal in I think about 10% of the cases. And then uh, there's no other full firm, firm recommendation for follow-up is often symptom, symptom based. Um, as I learned, a lot of cases can be symptomatic. And I think the if I had been wearing a smartwatch, which I do these days, uh, or a heart rate tracker, I would have picked up on that kind of um, abnormal pattern and self-reported so the, the idea is that that continuous monitoring perhaps plays a role. So in my other hat, I'm also a, a rare disease researcher professionally. I, my career has been devoted to developing therapies for rare diseases, not sarcoidosis. Not but sarcoidosis, know, right? But I know but the that, mindset. It's, I know just the so, mindset. it's so amazing that somebody who researches rare diseases winds up with a rare disease and, uh, and, and, and now you are uh, you, you're reaching out to say to say to other people, look out for this particular rare disease, sarcoidosis. Yeah, and uh, I, I, one of the things that and the one why I enjoyed the uh, the presentation at the American Thoracic Society so much was not only did I get the chance uh, to talk to a lot of pulmonologists, which, as you know, the lung is a major uh, affected organ. I thought that would be the best target audience for of of uh, caretakers. Uh, because they had, see a large population of uh, sarcoidosis patients that may not have cardiac disease yet. Um, and um, But I also got the chance to meet with uh, uh, the leaders of the Foundation of Sarcoidosis Research um, and was um, um, uh, and offered my, my time and whatever they needed me to do to promote the message. I also met people, physicians, who authored the consensus guidelines and suggested that some wording to this effect uh, be put in that, uh, uh, and, and then the trick is though, and I, I'm full aware as a person who researches rare disease, it's hard to make uh, evidence-based recommendations in rare diseases because there's not gonna be any evidence that shows wearing or continuously monitoring heart rate improves mortality in sarcoidosis patients. That's a tough thing to do. Um, and then base the recommendation on that Maybe eventually time will reveal that, but in the interim, my reasoning is is that uh, given the facts that um, AV block is a common, the most common form of heart disease in sarcoidosis patients, which can often be asymptomatic, um, and the cost of um, a heart rate tracker could be, you know, at least let's say 50, 60 bucks. You think you get three years out of it, maybe 20 yeah, bucks a year, right? right? My pacemaker costs the healthcare system several hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? So in that context, I feel like there should be at least some consideration or mention or debate uh, of considering uh, 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 that uh, patients with sarcoidosis should, should strongly consider wearing a heart rate tracker. So, um, so l let me just interrupt there because we're talking about heart rate trackers. That can sound like a big, scary device, but I'm wearing an Apple Watch. Right that now. is a heart rate tracker. It That's a heart rate tracker, right? It's a it's a it's a super duper one because uh, it's okay. a lot of other other things beside heart rate. But you're right; there are other name brands uh, that you can get that might just tell you the time of day and your heart rate without measuring anything else. But mm -hmm. they are um, they are. Um, I don't think anybody would really argue that their heart rate is not accurate, right? Like I think they, there there's a lot of a congruence between taking your pulse in a in a clinic and what the heart rate tracker is showing. Um, so you're right. I use the term heart rate tracker, but it could be a smartwatch. It could be, yeah, I, you know, be exercise, right, because, exercise sure. uh, device. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But of course, you know, random people um, aren't, you know, everybody, it, it's so hard because like you didn't know you're in the business and you didn't know until you went to your doctor and they started looking that there was something wrong. You were asymptomatic. 
Correct. So, so people out there, you know, I mean, unless we start recommending that everybody wear a heart rate tracker, which maybe, maybe that's what we should do. Uh, and because I'm a, a workout workoutaholic, mm-hmm. I check mine all the time. My, my heart rate right now is 56. Um, and I'm always on my bike. And if I'm climbing a hill, I'll, you know, I'll look down and say, all right, how, what is my heart rate now? Because this is feeling really hard, you know, and it'll, it'll be in zone two, zone three. So I'll be up. Uh, I think my, uh, your, your theoretical maximum heart rate is 220 minus your age, right? Mm -hmm. Have you heard that? Formula I've heard before. some versions of that. I, I don't recall exactly what the numbers are. So, so I don't know. That's what they tell us at the gym. So that's what I always use. And there, are, there are times when I'm in, I'm in like the ninety percentile of that. Um, but you know, most of the time when I'm just walking around, I feel like, wow, I'm pretty healthy. I, you know, my resting heart rate is in the mid fifties. Yay me! And mm-hmm. uh, but if you take that logic, you say, oh, my resting heart rate is in the 30s. Well, all of a sudden, no, that's a red flag. That doesn't mean that you have this big, powerful, healthy heart. That means there's a problem, right? In, in, in the vast majority of cases, yes. And I, I'm not, I'm not lobbying for everybody to wear uh, and monitor their heart rate. But my, my, uh, my um, assertion is that the the Anytime you rec- make a recommendation, you worry about false positives that, you know, you get all these unnecessary visits because all these people have a lot of data and they're, mm-hmm. you know, more often than not, it's just nothing. But um, given the facts that um, in a very specific way, sar- heart disease is very uh, uh, common in sarcoidosis patients in that population, I think a decreasing heart rate would be much more specific to a conduction problem in the heart rather than something that I'm just in better shape, say if you're in the general population, right? So if somebody starts working out and their resting heart rate goes from 90 to say 70 or even 60, it's probably like, good, good, you're in great shape. But if um, without changing um, any anything overtly in their life and a sarcoidosis patient is seeing a decreasing heart rate, that likely would be more likely be something specific or an early indicator of disease. Of course, you can always get false positives and uh, kind of false alarms, so to speak, in terms of a decreasing heart rate. But I think um, the the population itself, given that AV block, this kind of conduction abnormality is very common, and given that it's asymptomatic, and also the punchline is earlier diagnosis, the better the outcome. I feel like all that taken together uh, makes them, uh, it would be reasonable to uh, to, um, have one on, you know, in, given all those check boxes of things that that could go right if you wear one, yeah. So just about a year ago this week, you published an article in MedPages MedPage Today's KevinMD.com about your situation, um, and it's a really really interesting read, and I will put uh, a link in the show notes. Um, but you were trying to make it easier for people to talk about this. And one of the things you said early on, I'm going to read from your article here. You wrote, not surprisingly, many people living with rare conditions are exhausted by the effort required to accurately explain and sometimes pronounce their illness. So they often resort to canned perfunctory explanations. And you wrote, I am no different. Sometimes I let people assume that I had a common heart attack and I don't challenge the unspoken sentiment. Poor guy should have taken better care of himself. What what made you put that so far up in your article? Um, well, it it is uh, you know um, uh, people care about me, right? I've you know I'm very good. I'm very you know a very um, you know not an isolated person. I hope everybody has a good network of support and friends. And but after a while, explaining the very nitty gritty details it gets exhausting um so maybe i do make a cutoff i guess if they're really not if they're an acquaintance i might just you know take the pity uh but i internally know the the fact that i was in such good shape was the reason i survived with the low heart rate um that was uh caused by uh the the, uh has nothing to do with my physical fitness or health right right so I, I um, put that in there just to highlight or bring out some uh, 
um, some situations uh, that people with rare diseases may find themselves in is that how much down the truth truthful path do I go, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and I think I'm really I'm bringing that up because I am willing to bet you dollars to donuts that a large percentage of the people who listen to this podcast, this particular one, or listen regularly to the FSR Sark Fighter podcast, have that same situation. So for me, um, I have uh, I have neurosarcoidosis on my spinal cord. So they they determine that with a biopsy on the back of my neck which quickly became me just telling people uh, it was on my back. And so here I'm walking around with neurosarcoidosis and people will say, how's your back? And, <laughs> and rather, rather than give them the lengthy explanation about all the, all the things that are like the reasons that's not actually my back, um, I just say it's fine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, because it is, it's exhausting to go through that whole explanation over and over and over um, and I mean, probably people don't want to hear it. They just wanted to ask you how you're doing, right? Yeah. Did, uh, do you think really, that's fair? You the cues. Yeah, you pick up the cues. Like, you know, sometimes, as you know, like, it's nice to say, how are you? But then you kind of know socially, do they really want to know? Or do they just want, you know, yeah, I'm doing fine. You know, so have a good day. <laughs> yeah. And that, well, they're trying to indicate that they care enough about you that they know at least enough to ask about something specific about your illness. How's yeah. your back? Um, yeah. Even though, and probably through no fault of their own, uh, they, they got one sort of... Um, glossed over version of the story and that's what stuck and it's easy yeah. to remember oh so and so has a back problem you know yeah. So, yeah yeah so i mean what is what what you have your training your your collegiate training was at yale is that correct yeah um i i love to learn so i think um the joke about me is i'm an eternal student so i took the long path uh to to get to where i am it was um uh, you're right, but before medical school, I had a PhD in chemistry, so I got a PhD and then went to med school, and then after that, I uh, did the full clinical training. So I'm actually uh, licensed and board certified as a pediatrician, but a pediatric endocrinologist. So we we study childhood uh, disorders of growth and metabolism, you know, thyroid, adrenal gland, uh, growth hormone, all that fun stuff. Um, uh, um, I, I, uh, I focused on, I just fell in love with the field. So, yeah. And, um, uh, initially I was, uh, in, in academics as a professor and transitioned to doing work in industry to develop more, um, um, more, uh, therapies for pediatrics and genetic diseases. And, um, uh, there are very few pediatricians who are doing research and there are, uh, there are a group, but, but I think it's a field where it's really been satisfying to be um, behind the scenes, so to speak, uh, leading uh, research, clinical research to develop new therapies. So, and with some successes and, and, and you know, not everything works, but um, having an, enough of a tease of what it looks like to work on something that, that uh, goes to fruition and becomes a useful therapy for kids is very satisfying. So I don't know if I answered your question, but yeah, it's my trajectory has been one of um, uh, curiosity driven kind of living and i um, very thankful to be um, able to keep contributing and working despite, you know, this bump in the road in my health. Yeah. So do you do more work like um, on the research side or are you in clinic or is it 50, 50 where, where, when you get, cause you're working from your home office this morning. So you're not seeing patients there. Um, what, what does the majority of your work look like these days? Yeah, I stopped seeing patients about um, when I when I went full time in the research mode um, mm-hmm. here in um, uh, because I, I think with, for me and I had a great bedside manner. Patients loved me, but for me, I think it really came down to you never know. Um, uh, being a, a pediatrician, um, I think we see patients over years. Uh, we often develop bonds with the patient, seeing them go from a baby to. In the same way with pediatric endocrinology, we tend to for, follow patients over and kids over, you know, a longer period of time. And uh, any one of those children could get very sick at any time. And I, I felt like 
it wouldn't be right to have like a dabble in clinic and then not be available for any future care or support that a family or a child may need. So I made the decision, although I keep my board certification, my knowledge and um, my uh, license active, I don't currently see patients while I'm full-time in, in research. Uh, luckily, endocrinology is one of those fields where we don't do a lot of procedures. I, you don't get rusty with, uh, with any sort of uh, thing. We just think a lot. <laughs> uh, we're, we're, and so uh, it, it's, it, it, it's one of those fields where um, um, there, there, there's no um, attrition of, of dexterity or anything like that, but you do have to keep on top of uh, the literature. And I try as much as possible uh, to um, stay abreast and, uh, and maintain my uh, the knowledge of the field. But um, short answer, yeah, no, I, I am working uh, outside the clinic these days. Okay, great. I want to go back to something you said earlier that you had some, in hindsight, early warning signs for sarcoidosis. What would those have been? Well, you know, and, I, and, and hearing stories of other people living with rare diseases, you kind of fumble through things and you recover and you don't think about them. But yeah, I had um, uh, bouts of um, alopecia areata where patches of hair loss that I, it's an indicator of autoimmune disease. Um, I, for a few years, I had this debilitating, uh, uh, I didn't know if it was nerve pain. It was more, felt like more my muscles were freezing up. And I really shuffled around I, and uh, didn't quite, I saw a rheumatologist and it wasn't in my head because my inflammatory markers were markedly elevated. So something organic was going on in my body. Um, and, but it, we never really could quite figure out what it was. And then, you know, it kind of resolved. And then I had a kidney stone and, you know, like all these little patchwork of things were likely manifestations of sarcoidosis, but not specific enough to say, aha, um, and then when I had the kidney stone, they, um, um, it, for better, for worse, I started reading about kidney stones and muscle pains and trying to figure out things. And I went down some blind alleys of self-diagnosis, you know, and, um, uh, and, uh, so long story short, looking back, I, I feel like it was all probably small clues that something more um, ominous was brewing systemically, um, and, um, uh, with, um, um, but in, in all that time, um, the, the, the cardiac manifestations was really not on my radar at all, you know? Um, so I think that what really was a wake up call. And, um, so I, I do feel like I had some stuff going on, I would say as early as, um, 15, 20 years ago when, when oh, wow. kind of my hair started falling out. Yeah. So yeah. I want to ask you, did you ever have any rashes that were unexplained? Um, no, but I did have these skin findings uh, that I remember when I was in residency training, um, I went to see, there were like little bumps and I don't even know if it's related to sarcoidosis, but these little bumps, non itchy that I saw a dermatologist about it. They said, so I think it was some lichen nitidus. I'd never heard of it, but mm -hmm. it was interesting you bring that up because just in the last few months, and maybe I don't really look at my my finger skin too often, but I noticed that those patches were gone. So indicating that maybe, you know, with the treatment, with the methotrexate, the disease, my heart disease being controlled, that it kind of, that was maybe part of this autoimmune kind of reaction on the skin. But I do know that sarcoidosis had a lot, has a lot of uh, skin manifestations, but mm -hmm. I don't think I'm, uh, at least yet, you know, you never know, uh, has been affected by that in a major way. Yeah. And your muscles freezing up, describe that. Um, it's like, uh, it was like pins and needles. It was a little bit, um, almost to the point where you become stiff. So uh, people would say that I was walking uh, like somebody much older than my actual age, uh, shuffling gait almost Parkinsonian, uh, so not really able to run or even jog. So just, but uh, you know, the funny thing is my mind was intact. Like I can think, I can work, I can be productive in that sense. Very thankful for that, but definitely felt um, uh, frozen and um, 
how do you describe that? How you, how do you, how do you diagnose that? Um, I had been seeing a community rheumatologist, and he said I was one of the most puzzling cases. And uh, we had objective evidence; like I wasn't making it up, you know, because um, um, uh, you know my markers, my inflammation was was off. But um, and I I refused to like he had one proposed in in, in a caring way. Why don't we put you on a little steroids to kind of see if it helps it? I'm thinking that it's some undefined autoimmune process, but I didn't want to go on steroids without a diagnosis because I felt that it would obscure anything um, ultimately to help with the diagnosis. So there was a period that I probably lived with that longer than I should, but I was really adamant about not treating something you don't know what you're treating. So um, yeah, so that that looking back, I do feel that um, you know you yourself having neurosarcoidosis there are definitely an, a, 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 you know kind of nerve um, neuromuscular related symptoms but uh, and maybe body aches is, is a is a manifestation these kind of non specific body it was all over it was upper and lower extremities it wasn't mm -hmm. localized to say C seven C six like you couldn't really pin it down to a particular uh, dermatome but um, it just had diffuse pain and that really doesn't point to any specific disease. No, 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 I'm just, I'm, I'm going through my litany of clues that I missed. How about hot flashes? Ever no, have hot flashes, that, unexplained no. hot flashes? No. no. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Well, um, I, it's when I've talked to my doctors and said, wow, how could I have known that this was going on? And then and, and with all the different people I've interviewed on the show, you know, they've, they've all sort of asked various ways, the same type of question, you know, could, could I have seen this coming sooner if I'd known what to look for? Um, those were some of the things that came up and my doctor said, yeah, you know, those, those all make sense with what your ultimate diagnosis was. So I'm, um, I'm just curious, just curious. And, and me being a runner, you know, I had, I, I had these uh, sensations in, in my lower calf when I was mm -hmm. running which essentially it didn't feel like a cramp, but it functioned like a cramp and that I would get this tightness hmm. uh, and to where, you know, when I was in shape to run 10 or 15 miles, I couldn't run a mile. Hmm. And I've never heard anybody describe their muscles being frozen before till you just said it. Hmm. And I thought, well, maybe that was because I could never explain it to anybody. And yeah. so I thought, mm, maybe, maybe you were feeling something that was the same. So I'm just, I'm exploring, I'm exploring here. Yeah. Um, I will. I have, um, I had taken uh, videos of uh, people of me trying to run and mm -hmm. it was definitely labored. Um, just trying to jog I think this, um, it was limited by the muscle. And, um, I, I, I don't know what happened. Then I got better. I, I loosened up and, uh, um, it was so thankful to be able to move normally again. And, um, and uh, I do have, um, I did a later x-ray more recently, um, had shown the characteristic lung patterns, uh, what do you see with, uh, with pulmonary sarcoidosis, but my pulmonary function testing has been normal. So uh, as with many patients with sarcoidosis, the lung findings don't necessarily trigger a treatment. And uh, so I, I, I always um, uh, felt that that didn't really give me any illness. It's just a finding, uh, but the, the muscle manifestations, maybe the hair, skin, um, and uh, obviously the cardiac were the ones that mm -hmm. made me realize that that turned me into uh, somebody with a serious illness. Um, the lungs for me, thankfully, have been normal and stable um, uh, since kind of the, the uh, certainty of the diagnosis with the specific heart findings. I get annual uh, pulmonary function testing and it seems to be stable and normal. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So do you continue to take methotrexate or are you off of all medications? Where are you? You know, uh, I'm, I'm on, um, yeah, so I play the odds and I think uh, I'm not um, uh, willing and nor is my doctor recommending that I come off methotrexate. I rather leave, well, uh, you know, at the end of the day, um, how much time does it take to take these medications? Uh, really a split second in the morning, maybe a split second at night. I think for me, that investment is worth it. So although um, I can experiment with coming off 
because my heart's stable, like I mentioned, it's recovered. I can, I can experiment, say, hey, why do I need these medications? Uh, why do I need to be on these heart failure medications? I, I think everything's going. I tend to um, look at the population-based data and show that patients in this current category of heart failure do tend to live longer if they're maintained on these medications. There is a chance that the disease will come back if you stop methotrexate. And um, um, so I think the benefit for me to taking it versus uh, not is psychologically and I think medically better. Uh, so I, I'm not the one to say a dream of the day where I'm not uh, treated. I kind of look at the right side and say, wow, like I get to live like this if, and all I have to do is just take this once in the morning, once in the night, and it's like less than a minute. By the way, I've kind of set it up that, you know, that's like, a, like oh, this the, that's the ticket into living really well. So I'll, I'll take that, you know. Gotcha. Yeah, no, I, I understand. And of course, the long-term exposure to medications does come with its own risk, but um, you probably more than anybody understand what the risk-reward ratio is there. Yeah. And, you know, well, at the end of the day, when you are a patient and not the physician, it's really, there's nothing the data can tell you. You just go with your feeling. And uh, I think it's really that um, appreciation that, you know, there, these things may help and it may help me live longer and productively. And I almost mentally, I know it's kind of silly. I just will away the side effects like, oh, these have no side effects and therefore I will not have side effects. And uh, I don't like in my mind, uh, like I joked before, maybe one piece of the pie is taken away, but I think overall I'm pretty, pretty good energy. I think people probably still need to keep up with me rather than me keeping up with other people. Uh, and um, uh, so that's good. And, um, and I'm sure there is a little bit, um, some of the medications do cause fatigue, uh, some, um, but I just power through it. Um, and um, the methotrexate can cause liver enzyme elevations. And I did go through a period of that, but um, now I spread my dose over 24 hours. So I don't take it all at once and one, you know, pop all pills at once. I spread it over 24 hours and that seemed to do the trick. So, um, so there are side effects, some real, obviously, um, but um, I try to kind of brainstorm with my physicians about what's the best way we can do about circumventing them, you know? Okay. And then just real quickly, because you're in the rare disease space, what's your opinion on what causes sarcoidosis? Do you have one? Oh, uh, I think as you read any article, review article, ultimately, who, who knows, right? I think one of the first things the members of uh, the leaders of the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research asked me was, is there any major stressor that happened when you first started having the symptoms? And I, I just responded, well, my life's full of stress. Like it's just, it's been that way constant throughout my life. Did that cause it? I don't know. Um, there's no autoimmune disease in my family that I know of. Um, so it's really a sporadic um, um, uh, kind of um, event, um, completely blindsided me. Um, um, and yeah, at, and at the end of the day, as is with rare disease, who knows is basically the answer, um, I, I don't know why in particular, and I don't know anybody in my family, extended family that has it. Uh, there's no trickle of autoimmune disease in my family. It's a spurious thing. So maybe it's just, uh, maybe it was the stress. Maybe it was, um, um, you know, the, the pandemic. I, I don't know. Like it's, it, you know, you can get into all these different theories. Well, half it during the pandemic, it must be you know, mm. triggered by, you know, this virus, or as far as I know, I've never had COVID. Um, but um, uh, maybe the isolation was stressful, who knows, right? So, but I did, you know, being a physician in, in training, it was certainly a very stressful, hardworking kind of training period. So I can't, I, there wasn't really a time in my life that for an extended period, obviously, vacations are fun, that my professional life wasn't stressful. Uh, but uh not every physician in training gets sarcoidosis either. So it's, right. it's a combination of things. Right. Unknown, right. Ultimately, ultimately unknown. Yeah. Okay. So Kamal, anything else you want to, uh, anything else you want to add? No, uh, I'm really thankful for this opportunity uh, to speak and hopefully there, 
listeners with sarcoidosis li listening, my main take home message is not really to focus on me, but just to convey some of the conclusions I reach and try to articulate both at major mo medical meeting and um, uh, through my writing and through my discussion with you that if you have sarcoidosis and you don't have any known cardiac disease, I, um, and it, again, it's not based on any official recommendations, but I think I would ask people to consider monitoring their heart rate as it could be an early sign of heart disease and just be raising the awareness of the cardiac heart, which is the leading cause of mortality in the end, at the end of the day, it's a major problem for, for people with sarcoidosis in terms of their, um, their life. So, okay. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. But uh, thank you, John. Take care. I feel like a zombie just feeding at stumbling. So thanks to Dr. Baruka for joining me and for sharing his story. And if you needed an excuse to get an Apple Watch, well, there you go. Uh, it's just easy to hit a button and check your heart rate and see... If it is someplace that it is not supposed to be, someplace unusual right about now, mine is at 58 beats per second. I, I do look at it a couple of times a day. I look at it when I'm working out. And uh, yeah, that's that's where it's supposed to be. Actually, it's about, normally it's 54 is my resting heart rate, but I'm all amped up right now because I'm podcasting. So it's a, it's a few beats per second higher, but at least I can track it. All right, the official Sark Fighter song is called Zombie by Mark Steyer and his band, the White Hot Lizards. You can hear Mark's story, the story behind the lyrics in episode 12, which should be live once again because now I've fixed the back end of the FSR website. And I can tell you that Mark has also been a recent guest. He's updated his situation here on the podcast and uh, he, uh, he's had kind of a tough run of it. It hasn't been normal for him. So go back and listen to episode 118, Mark Steyer uh, and his wife, Kaylee. And Kaylee, by the way, uh, is uh, his caregiver uh, and his partner, but she's also our partner in that she uh, is going to run the New York City Marathon on behalf of the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research. It is, uh, she is an official FSR marathoner. She got one of the spots that FSR has in the marathon, and she's fundraising. So go back and listen to that episode, and I'll put a link in the show notes here. You can click on it, and you can make a donation to help Kaylee and to help FSR. Uh, remember, I release this podcast every other Monday as I'm speaking today. Yes, my trusty dog, Dougal, is curled up in the chair in my office and my special little auxiliary dog, Pippa, who doesn't spend a lot of time in the office, is actually sleeping under the table. So I have two dogs today. And the backstory to the foundation, uh, the founding of the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research is episode 11 with Andrea and Redding Wilson. They started FSR at their kitchen table more than 20 years ago. And thank you, thank you, thank you. Don't forget to follow me on social media as Sark Fighter. Look on Facebook, Instagram, even on Peloton. And I just published a new blog under Carl, my Carl and the Cyclist blog, I have a section called Cycling with Sarcoidosis, and I just uh, just put a new blog out there to talk a little bit about some of my recent adventures and, and Sark. And if you're just trying to figure out what sarcoidosis is, please go back and listen to Episode 2 with Dr. Simon Hart, and my story is Episode 1. Once again, if you'd like to appear on the podcast, I'm getting lots of emails, so uh, I know this works. Send me an email, carlinagency at gmail.com. It's in the show notes, uh, the description of this podcast, and you can just click on the link there. All right. Till next time, keep fighting. Learn to suffer. You feel pain someday. Learn endurance. Your strength will fade away. Dead man walking. Trying to keep up the pace. Dead man walking. Counting down